So let's begin with a prayer, if we might. And I'm going to, we are still in the 17th Sunday, week of the 17th Sunday of Pentecost and the collect uh, of the day that we read to begin our worship this past Sunday is still pretty fitting for the subject at hand. So um, I'm going to offer it again. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So now that we're resolved not to be anxious about earthly things, I'm going to call on the treasurer and I'm going to share my screen. Hang on just a minute. Uh, Denis, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. I will start uh, with uh, the audited financial statement, statements for 2022. They actually, for the first time in our history, will be audited. And the auditor's report, up to now, we only had a review of our accounts by an accounting firm. Now, by law, we are required to have our accounts audited by a commissaire aux comptes, whom you elected in our uh, June uh, general meeting, you may remember, uh, his, audit, his audit report is in the making and will be presented to the next general meeting in Wiesbaden. So far, so good. 2022 was a year indicating a return to normal after two years of turmoil due to the pandemic. Uh, 2022 had had its own causes for turmoil, but which did not affect uh, our budget significantly. Significantly, it will have other consequences, which I will talk to you about. But uh, 2022 was basically re back to normal fiscal year. We continued with the 5% cut in the assessments, which was carried forward for 2023. Uh, the different programs, commissions, uh, did not completely go back to normal. And we will see that when we go into details about uh, our expenses. Bishop and staff returned to previous travel levels and. We won't have any surprise there. Congregations retain strong overall contributions in spite of uh, in spite of the difficulties of the time. Our investments or the grants we received from essentially from the Board of Foreign Parishes was higher than budgeted, uh, essentially due to the, the, the strong performance of the dollar against the euro. And um, the big novelty of 2022, you all are aware of, was uh, the, the, the major, major grant from Episcopal Relief and Development, which was made to the convocation. And the convocation was entrusted with the management of the uh, refugee program in Europe. And we are talking here of uh, tens and maybe hundreds of thousand dollars every year, but did not affect 2022 because it, it's hardly had it hardly started by year's end. Uh, next slide, please. On the revenue side, uh, there was, as I said, no surprise. So no surprises. Assessments were fully in line with the budget. Uh, investment income, which we should not call investment income in the future. And I think our Commissaire Ocult will have something to say about that. 
income from funds managed from grants based on based on investments, but not our investments, were higher than than budgeted, mostly due to the uh, to um, the return on on the NIS nice fund for the reasons I already explained to you. Draw from reserves is not really an income, it's an adjustment between revenues and expenses. And this is a difference, if you will, uh, which was budgeted for 77,000 euros. And at the end of the day, we only had to draw 28,000 euros from our uh, from our quote reserves unquote which is from our savings account with the bank in Paris next slide please expenses expenses we have to realize that convocation governance was much higher than expected than budgeted and this is only for one reason, for two reasons. One was a uh, general convention in Baltimore, uh, which had been under budgeted, and which in the end cost 30, 38, 38 and a half thousand euros against 30,000 in the budget. That's 130%, 120%. Uh, overspending, and the other cause was the uh, the annual convention, which uh, this year, as in twenty twenty two, comprised not only the convention but the festival of gatherings, which cost more than what had been budgeted. We will correct that in the future and maybe have a separate budget for the Festival of Gatherings, which would help see where we spend our money and where the, uh, how we balance each budget, convention, Festival of Gatherings. For the rest of the, uh, of the expenses, there is an overspending of 98% on uh, external relationships and communication, but this is a small budget. Uh, 3,000 had been budgeted, and we spent almost 6,000 of that, uh, mostly on communication and evangelism. And this this budget item will probably repeat itself year after year, if I'm, if I'm right. Commissions, commissions, as I said, are slow to get back to normal. The overall budget was spent at the... Uh, in the amount of uh, 21,570,000 euros. Uh, again, that's only just over a third of what had been budgeted. The budget was 57,550. Uh, home spent half of its budget. Children and youth surprisingly spent only 28%, but that's because traveling has not been has not been uh, performing as uh, it was before COVID. Uh, we will see that probably in 2023, this will be different. And in the budget of 2024, uh, we will probably get back to past practices uh, at this level. EICS spent 67% of its budget. It's not it's not the biggest budget of the commissions, the non commissions, but spent 5,000 with a budget of 7,500. Again, we expect that to change in the future. Support of congregations was almost at the budgeted level, 93%. Uh, Everything has been spent at 100%. Uh, overspent was Committee on Mission Congregations because they had a, a, a meeting which had been grossly underestimated. And uh, transition support interim was only a fraction of what had been budgeted. At 15% spent 230 euros, 226, where 1,500 euros had been budgeted. 
but this is again an amount which doesn't have a major influence and bear on the overall amount of expenses. Support of clergy, 58% if 20, spent in 2022, 11,385 euros spent for a budget of 19,660. This is mostly because there only was one retreat, uh, clergy retreat that year. Administrative costs were in line with budget. I'm not going to insist on that. Uh, if you need more, uh, if you have questions about a particular line item, please don't hesitate to ask me. Office, staff, well, everything was in line, actually. Maybe not Mark, Bishop Mark's travel, because uh, he returned to a normal uh, to a normal schedule, and, and furthermore, you had an expected. You, you did travel to Georgia, didn't you? In 2022, uh, and things like that. But again, we are speaking of very moderate expenses, and all in all, it doesn't affect the <laughs> the overall amount of uh, of overheads. Administration and completely, almost completely in line with with the budget, and uh, as you know, the big chunk of it is the, the the donation we make to the cathedral for the use of our the office space. Uh, they they give us this. In the end of the year we ended up with an operating result, negative operating result of 3,331, which again is not, not uh, a big deal. What caused the, 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 the overall deficit, deficit was you know, the restricted grants budget, but we have, uh, Again, our budgets are, we have yearly budgets, budget per, one budget per fiscal year. And in these, uh, these restricted grant budgets we have, we have income which may come in in a certain year and are not spent within that year. This is exactly what happened to the uh, seed grant uh, virtual to vital. Uh, we received a, a donation of, uh, uh, I should think twenty thousand dollars or more at in in um, twenty twenty one, which we hadn't spent. Which means that our 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 benefit our positive result in twenty twenty one was probably somewhat artificial. Remember, it was in the region of 125,000 euros. Uh, but some of it was due to unspent funds we had received for a specific purpose. And these funds were spent in 2022 and were not funded in 2022, which caused what looks like uh, a deficit, but seen as a multi multi-annual uh, program, it's not. So we had to draw this. This brought our deficit for the year to twenty three thousand, as I said, and we had to balance uh, our our uh, budget by drawing from our savings account with CIC, which again, and I will probably this will we go more into details when the the auditor has completed his um, his audit, which caused the uh, shareholders' value of the convocation to diminish by twenty three thousand against the end of twenty twenty one figure. Any questions on on 
Wow. Not seeing any. That's if you're having it. trouble, just a quick housekeeping. If you're having trouble unmuting yourself to ask a question or finding your regular uh, Zoom raise hand function, you're welcome to either type a message in the meeting chat on Zoom or on Whova. We're monitoring both of those places. We'll have more time for questions um, at the end too. So if I may, um, I'll pick it up from here. So I'm gonna go back to our slides. And um, so my beloved colleague, Denis has uh, presented to you the results for 2022. And for those of you who have been to one of these town halls before or to a convention of the convocation, you know that we always talk about the year that's behind and the year that's ahead, but we don't talk about the year that we're in. So we're not going to talk here about 2023, which is what I can tell you is, you know, ask your friendly members of the Council of Advice, but it's going well. We're on target. Um, and you'll hear about that a year from now. But right now, what we're going to do is turn to the proposed budget for 2024 that has been approved by the Council of Advice. So first, um, here are the planning assumptions that have gone into our thinking about drawing this budget together. Um, we said this last year. It's true again this year. Um, there's just a lot of uncertainty ahead of us in the economy and the way the economy affects the revenues and the ministry of the church. Um, there are still relatively high energy prices and relatively high inflation in the Eurozone. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about exchange rates, especially between the Euro and the dollar, we think, and those who advise us think the dollar will remain strong and may get a little stronger, um, which is a good thing for a portion of our revenues, more than 40% of our revenues now, because they come to us from um, the Board of Foreign Parishes, which is a charity, but it manages assets that are dollars. And so when they give us a grant, the dollars mean more when the dollar is stronger. We have an ongoing war to our East and Ukraine, and we don't know what that will mean for our future. Um, in terms of the economy, in terms of the sort of life of Europe. And then, as you know, we have some elections coming up in 2024 in the United States and in Europe. And the outcome of those elections may also cause some economic uncertainty. If you follow the news of the United States, you know that as of midnight tonight, Eastern time, it looks like much of the federal government will be shutting down for business. So that will have an effect on the markets. And um, we just live in a time of some economic uncertainty. One of the things that the Council of Advice has done, and I'll just own and say this is at my recommendation, is we in 2020, within a couple of weeks after the pandemic was declared, Council decided that we would put an across the board discount of 5% on everybody's assessment. We just understood that it was gonna be a tough time and an uncertain time. And we wanted to show that the convocation was aware of that and was prepared to, to take a little bit of a bite itself so that people had a little more ease. We think now the time has come as of the 1st of January to end that practice and to restore us all to paying our full assessment. So that we think won't be too burdensome. What we see is that our parishes and congregations are, are paying their full assessment. We, we've really been so thankful for everybody, you know, paying exactly what we ask. We, we have a very low assessment relative to the rest of the church at 9%. Um, that's, that's pretty low <laughs> compared to most dioceses. Um, and people honor that commitment. We're very thankful for that. Um, and this last point, we think that the strength of the dollar, as I mentioned, um, going forward is going to help us um, when it comes to the part of the, our revenues that come from grants from the United States. Um, it just benefits us in that way. Um, 
course, we don't know. Um, you know, the markets are going to take a hit this week because of the shutdown of the government. So that may be a little overstated. We can't count on it too much. So in all, um, we think one more time, a conservative approach has to be taken in the year ahead. We, we tried to fund the budget requests that have come our way from committees and commissions as well as we can, um, but we've really, you know, tried to find economies where we can. Um, I'm still operating at a, at a funding level for travel that's well below what had been the case for the bishop. Um, and, the, you know, we're just doing what we can to be very responsible with the resources that are entrusted to us. So here are some general observations about the year to come. Um, our operations are still resuming, um, but they sort of are resuming at different rates of speed. At the same time, if you look at the report that was sent to you <clears throat> in advance of this meeting, have a look at that table. I don't remember the page number, but it's at the very bottom of a page and it shows you the, the average pledge across the whole convocation for the last five years. And what you're gonna notice is not too surprisingly, last year, the last year for which we have data, um, 2022, that number dropped. It's very understandable. People are concerned about their own financial futures and they're pulling back a little bit on what they're able to give to the church. But that ultimately has an effect on the convocation as well, because it means that the, the revenue that our churches have, that we base our assessment on, is also shrinking a little bit. So we have to be aware that while the revenue that we get from U.S. grants rises, the revenue we're getting from assessments is, is tending to decline a little bit. We don't know what the future that will be. I think from a council and bishop perspective, it means we have to help our congregations do the work of stewardship and help them think creatively about how we do that. The ministry initiatives that we've started are now beginning to generate alternative sources of funding. Uh, we have invested pretty significantly, as you've seen, in children and youth. So one of the outcomes of our ministry initiative on ministry with children and youth is that we just have a larger budget for that commission. Refugees and migrants obviously is now being funded by this very generous grant from Episcopal Relief and Development. And so it does not appear on the operational budget for the simple reason that we now have a restricted grant dedicated to that purpose that is accounted for elsewhere. So uh, finally, we have the good news of the convocation is we have a lot of people who have given us grants, um, a lot of people who are supporting the programs and the ministry of the convocation. Those grants are restricted grants. That means that they have a specific purpose. They can only be used for that purpose. They don't benefit the operational budget, the general fund of the convocation. And the downside, the bad news of all of that generosity and all of those grants that are coming our way is they all come with an administrative burden. We have to run these programs and we have to be accountable for them. We have reporting requirements that we have to answer to. And all of that is really stressing the administrative capacity of the convocation's office. And so Council of Advice and the Bishop have been working to try to say, okay, well, how do we organize ourselves better to expand our ability to answer to those administrative needs. Okay, so let's look at what we expect to see next year in terms of revenue. This is a picture that'll be familiar if you came to this town hall last year. And I'll just go around the wheel beginning with assessments down at about four o'clock. Um, assessment payments are a little bit I anticipate to be a little bit lower than they were in 2023. We anticipate based on the parochial reports that you've all submitted now, we have a pretty clear idea of what that number will be and it'll be about 241,000 euros. But non-restricted grants, and that's this, this grant we get from the Board of Foreign Parishes, Small other sources, but mostly it's the it's the grant from the BFP. Um, we expect that to be about 292,500 euros next year. 
And the point to make at, at this juncture is take a look at the percentages that those two pieces of the pie represent. Assessments is now we're looking at 38% of all of our revenue and these non-restricted grants are 47%. Just a year or two ago, those percentages were not quite reversed, but assessments counted for the largest share of our revenue picture. And now that has changed. So we have to kind of keep an eye on that because it is important that we, we get all of us to get financially healthy and we can boost what our, our local budgets are and the, the adding on effect of that is assessment revenue for the convocation increases too. But right now we're depending more on the grants we receive from DFMS, the trust funds that are held at DFMS on our behalf. We don't own them, but they're, they were given for our benefit and we receive the income and from the grants we receive from the Board of Foreign Parishes. Okay. Um, anticipated miscellaneous income is a tiny disappearing sliver. It's almost nothing here. COVID load repayments that represents, as many of you know, the convocation entered into a program of no cost five-year loans with many of our congregations who needed help to get through the tough times of COVID. And now we're receiving repayments. Everybody's doing that at a, at a wonderful rate. We've had no trouble with anybody not paying back their COVID loan, but that's 20,000 euros a year of income on the revenue side for us. We also are still paying our loan from the Board of Foreign Parishes. The way that winds up being accounted for is in a reduced grant from the board. So we never see that money as an expense going out on the bottom, on the, below the line, let's say. We anticipate, we always plug in this number 20,000 euros for gifts and donations. I'm never ashamed to raise money for the convocation. Um, and we've been somewhat successful with that. Um, but what you'll hear in a separate report that you will receive as part of the delegates packet this year is that we had a very generous year uh, for, for the Bishop's Discretionary Fund. And the simple reason for that was the revival that took place in Paris. Um, we had a lot of costs associated with that event and a lot of people gave generously to help us pay for that event, not least the presiding bishop himself. And all of that, both income and expenditures flowed through the bishop's discretionary fund. So the final piece of this puzzle is the green slice of 9%, which represents what we anticipate would be our draw from reserves if everything on the expenses side of this proposed budget happened at exactly the budgeted rate we are thinking it will happen. Now, as you know from what Denis has just said, we budget for things that sometimes don't get spent. We budget for things to provide resources that sometimes are not used, and that's okay. We, we plan carefully. So we may not have to make that draw from reserves, but if we do, that we think is the top line of what it would be. And just so you know, if you're wondering what, what, is that, what does that represent in terms of an overall draw, presently our reserves stand at, I think the last number I checked was roughly 325,000 euros. So that is the expected revenue side. And I'll now turn to the expected expenses side, the way we plan to use those resources entrusted to us in 2024. And here's our, our favorite you know, so-called hierarchy chart, which is gonna show the blocks from biggest to smallest as we, as we build them. So the largest single block comes under administrative costs and it has these elements that you see here. Out of administrative costs, we pay for our staff, the archdeacon and the financial administrator. We pay for the bishop's expenses. That's my travel and my continuing education. Um, it's the, it's the, the resources that I have available to me when um, a guest speaker comes uh, at my invitation and I take them out to lunch. Um, that's what the bishop number represents. You'll see this number called overhead. That's the cost of the grant we make. It's a gift, it's not rent technically. 
to the cathedral for the space that we use there. It's the cost of copiers and internet access and everything that goes into the overhead of any organization. Then you'll see this box called project administrator. As a part of our grant from Episcopal Relief and Development, the grantor, ERD, has come to us to say, we think you need more administrative capacity in order to do the work that you're doing. We think you need more administrative capacity to help run the grant that we're giving you, and we are willing to share in those costs with you. So this number anticipates a cost share between the grant from Episcopal Relief and Development and the operational fund of the convocation to hire somebody who would be in the role of program and administrative manager for us, who would basically help to collect the reports and assure compliance with the terms of the grants we've received and help do this increasing administrative burden that we have because of the restricted grants we've received. Everybody should know, every delegate and every voting member of the clergy should know that one of the realities for our financial administrator over the past few years has been an increase in the burdens that she faces because of changes in the laws of France and because of changes in how we are now incorporated. So Sophie has a bigger job, independent of all of the things that we're doing. And we just have to acknowledge that we need more administrative bandwidth. So that's what that number represents. Second biggest block is governance. And the largest chunk of this, I did not break this block down into the pieces of that as you see it on the spreadsheet that you've been given, the, the detailed line item budget. But once again, coming up in 2024, we have a general convention. We'll be in Louisville, Kentucky. We know from recent experience, as Denis mentioned, that our, uh, our imagined budget of 30,000 euros for the 2022 convention uh, was inadequate by about a third. And so we just need to be realistic that inflation in the United States has been true as it has been here, and we will likely spend more. We budgeted for, I think, 40,000 euros for general convention. That's the, the, the single thing that I pick up to take note of in that, in that budget. The next largest budget is support of congregations. And there is a change that we announced at this time last year <clears throat> that is now going to be implemented with this convention. Rather than present to you a budget that has specific proposed grants, line item by line item for different congregations, we're coming to convention with one number called building mission grants from which we will make those grants. We're asking convention to think in terms terms of what is the overall priority of the money we want to make available for grants to our congregations. That should be the level of focus for convention. Then it's for the finance committee to receive those grant requests and we will start receiving them immediately after convention ends to review them and to recommend to the council of advice how, they, how these different grants should be funded that, we've, that people have applied for. Council will make those decisions at its December meeting and the funds will be awarded in January. So it has greatly shrunk the time between applying for a grant and receiving a grant. It used to be there was a hang time of nine months there. We're now gonna make it more like two months. We hope that helps everybody's planning a little more than we used to be doing. Support of clergy remains at about the same level, 19,600. Euros COMC is budgeted under support of congregations. Um, partly that's because the Committee on Mission Congregations is a committee of the Council of Advice canonically. So it belongs more in this part. There's an argument that maybe we ought to break it out on its own, but it still lives in this part. And then that one little piece here that doesn't have a name <laughs> is because the name couldn't fit in that little box, but the name is transition support for parishes. And that's the funding that we spend on background checks for every new member of the clergy who comes to service here in Europe. Money that we spend on doing mutual ministry reviews that are part of the, the letters of agreement every member of our clergy signs. Money we spend on a consultant that helps a parish begin a search process. So that's 
what that little slice represents. The next box is commissions. And as you'll see, children and youth, now we've significantly increased the investment we make in ministry with children and youth. Um, it is the largest piece of this pie. And that, as your bishop, that seems to me very appropriate. Many of our congregations are having to rebuild youth and children's ministries from zero because of the impact of the pandemic on those programs. We're now going to be looking for a new coordinator uh, to serve us because Katie Osweiler and Greg Stark, who have been sharing that role for us, are both moving on to new ministries and new seasons in their life. So fairly soon, the convocation will be posting for a new person to serve in the role of coordinator of ministries with children and youth. And that person works alongside Hydran Alfka, who's the chair of the commission and the whole commission to carry out and help support the programs that happen in our congregations. EICS has plans for uh, an in-person Academy of Parish Leadership in the year to come. Um, ministry initiatives is the place where we budget for, and I'm gonna bring up that little number here, beloved community and creation and climate care. And what you're gonna see in beloved community looks like a dramatic increase year on year. The reason for that is at our last convention in 2022, we passed a resolution calling on the bishop and the council of advice to create a position known as coordinator for beloved community or missioner for beloved community. David, in case you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong here. And to fund that role, which we've done at 10,000 euros. So this is meant to be a person among us who's a resource and a leader in helping us think about racial justice and building beloved community at the level of each of our congregations. So that's the, that's the jump in that number, which now is at 15,000. Um, climate and creation care remains at 1,000. We, we don't have a lot of demand for budget in that ministry initiative. And as I mentioned, the refugee and migrant ministry initiative now lives in the restricted grant from the Episcopal Relief and Development. So the final little piece is this orange piece, external relations and communications, which as Vinny mentioned, is a small slice. Um, the smallest of our slices, but it, we remain it, uh, putting it there. It's where we give our contribution to the Anglican Center in Rome and where we will probably find a little bit of budget for um, support of what we anticipate will be a new website for the convocation in the year to come. So that's the presentation for both uh, revenue and expenses in the year to come. And I'll stop sharing my screen and happy to take any questions. Gosh, then we can't possibly have done it that well, can we? You're, you're muted, Denny. I would say maybe we could skip conventions. <laughs> no, 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 no. So uh, everybody on this call should know you're, you're here because you're interested in these matters and we're thankful that you are. Our convention this year, is going to seem a little different around issues of budget and reporting because, as Denis mentioned, we now have a statutory auditor, a commissaire compte, and the law requires that that auditor makes a presentation to us at the time of our Assemblée Générale to present the audited financials of the previous year of 2022. So that will happen. Um, and we are, we are, we've had a meeting with Paul Prudhomme, who's our new, wonderful new person. And uh, we sort of think we know what's going to happen. Um, we'll be all doing it for the first time, but we know we're going to have to create a little more space in the agenda for what has historically been a somewhat 
odd and perfunctory moment. Now it won't be quite so perfunctory. It'll be substantial and we will, we will receive that report. So we're gonna be putting these slides uh, as a PDF into Whova, into the resource that we're all sharing now um, so that it's available to all of the delegates, this little explanatory of the, of the memo, the report, the formal report from the treasurer that went out. Um, and obviously if anybody has any questions about this, um, we're more than happy to welcome them. We do this exercise of the town hall to, in the interest of transparency, to make sure everybody has received the information well in advance and can study it. And, you know, to be honest, we also do it so that we can spend our time together at convention um, doing things we hope are more edifying. You know, we wanna explain to you everything that you have a question about but we'd, we'd rather not do it during the precious time we have together. <laughs> so. Bishop Mark, I'd like to voice a question from the chat. Uh, Pippa yeah. has asked, will the audited report presentation be in French or English? Denis, would you Denis like- Denis has answered. <laughs> it will be, it will, it's will. it in French, but it will be translated into English. And the auditor, uh, presentation will also be uh, is not that proficient in English you see but uh, we are looking for a solution to have to have his uh, presentation uh, interpreted into English thank you the, the secretary of convention has been recruited to help solve this problem so excellent. I am I'm expecting that it'll be excellent. There'll be a creative solution. Um, oh I, I see I, I just see him hello. appearing. Uh yes. Um I actually I was um, I understood from Denis that we did not need interpretation. So I did not follow up on that with Schroeder. The report will be available short before <coughs> convention. Uh so if you would it's just a matter of reading the. I know, I know you're not an interpreter, Richard. You told me that. I remember. Uh, well, if you send it, you... yeah. If you send it to me in advance, I can translate it, and then people would have it in English. Oh, that might save time. It, it, yeah. and and assure assure us uh, of, of, of the of a good translation. Yeah, then all that I can do. Okay. We will know need to provide, you know, should someone have a question from the floor in English, we'll we'll need to provide a means for questions and answers to be mutually understood. Well, I, I think I could handle that, yeah. 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 But if you want to send me the report, Denis, before convention, then I will translate it before it I come will to be sent it will be sent to you. Okay. And don't expect it to come, you know, like two weeks in advance. It might be, it might be uh, eight eight days before convention. That's but fine. It, it, it should not be. Uh, it should not be uh, a hefty report, you know. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. And I can work with you. On, I can work with you on the translation if. The technical terms, for instance. Debbie, did you have a question? Yes, um, I'm going to be brave and ask it. Um, I wanted to refer to the graph that you put on where our revenue came from, and yeah, I'll bring it right 40, back up. Okay, the the forty seven percent that is um, considered non restricted grants mostly mm -hmm. from DFMS. No, so, no, mostly from yes, the Board yes. of Foreign Parishes. Okay, sorry, because I do, I get them confused. 
Yeah. Okay, from Board of Fer Foreign Parishes, just to clarify my comprehension of this, this is something that we always can foresee because of the way our finances are held. And we went through quite a large, as I remember, we went through quite a large exercise in not having funds held in Europe in euros for tax purposes, reasons, Correct. it's very complicated. So it's all back in New York. And mm -hmm. it's, it's the word grant that, um, that I felt needed reclarified in my brain that it's not that we're arbitrarily waiting every year for um, Board of Farm Parishes to decide if they'll give us 47% or 35% or whatever, that in fact, we can preview that because it is something that we have made an agreement annually for how much we would expect. Is that very, simple, sort of. in a very simplified manner, a correct assumption? Um, I, 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 would, I would amend it only slightly. The Board of Foreign Parishes is a nonprofit corporation in the state of New York. It exists for charitable purposes. It holds, it owns a portfolio of funds and it has a policy for how it invests those funds and for how it distributes a percentage of the income of those funds on an annual basis. It, it is independent of the convocation and of the Episcopal Church, actually. It is, it is, it is self-governing. It has a single charitable object, and that is the convocation of Episcopal churches in Europe. It does not support any other charity. It could choose to do, but it has been in business since 1883, and it never has done. So we are the charitable object of that independent foundation. We know because they tell us, we, I, I, myself and James Harlan, our new dean, are members of that board. We sit in the boardroom twice a year. We know what the policies are for both investment and distribution. And we are part of the discussion every November about what the proposed distribution is. So we know, we knew last November what the what the expected payment would be for 2023 and that's what we base this assumption on but it's important to say that it is a grant it's not investment income because it's not our investment we don't own it we don't direct it we can't determine it we simply are the only object of the charitable action of the board of foreign parishes does that answer your question it's getting yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So Debbie, Debbie, if you would, and this is what is hard to explain to our to our statutory auditor, uh, we cannot be certain of the amount of grants we received from the Board of Foreign Parishes. We just assume because we know what their policy is that we can expect a certain level of right. certainty from them, especially since they announce it in advance, how much they, and, and yep. the average, and the average that distribution over a period of three years, I think. It is actually, I mean, we, we know the policy. The policy is they, they take the last 13 quarters of the, of the, portfolio's value. So every quarter the portfolio has a value. They take the last 13 quarters, average it, and pay 3% of that every year. That's the calculation. So the reason for doing 13 quarters is simply that it flattens out the, the hills and valleys and it makes it a much more predictable number. The, sing, the, the, the single largest reason why that grant has increased as it has, well, the, first of all, there's market performance in the United States, but also the strengthening of the dollar that has really helped us. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. 
Well, thank you, everybody. If there are no other questions. We're, I, I want to acknowledge the, oh, yes, yes. I do want to voice uh, for those of you who are joining from Cuba. Thank you so much for using the question and answer uh, function in Cuba. It's glad, I'm glad to see that we're able to use the tools that we have. And I want to voice um, this remark in Q&A, which says, no questions. Just thanks to all for a clear presentation and careful attention to our resources and how they are being used. Okay. And it was, it, was it was actually upvoted. So that's not just one person, that's multiple people <laughs> wishing to express gratitude to our financial officers. And the, the treasurer wants to express his personal and professional gratitude to the president of the association for his <laughs> perfect slides i'm um, as you know i'm i'm not very very uh, a very able user of uh, new technologies which are not that new after the uh, new, new right. to me we, many times thank you we, thank thank you mark yeah. for uh, your <laughs> enormous help and these magnificent slides which you crafted you're very welcome Denise. Barehanded. We, we, we do it together. We do it together. There's so much I don't understand. So thank you for that. And Malia, thank you for bringing this all together and making the technology work. Some of you will remember that we used Whova, uh two years ago, was it? When we were gathered together in Nice. And wow, did we get a lot of positive feedback about using Whova for gathering us together in the convention. And uh, it is completely to credit, to Malia's credit, that she came to us this year and said, we got to do this again. So we did. And thank you, Malia, for making it work. With that, blessings to everybody. We look forward to seeing you in Wiesbaden on the 19th yeah. of October. All right. Bien pretzels.